Greetings aspirants, first of all I have an announcement for you, this is regarding pre-storming batch 5. As you all know pre-storming is the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankar IS Academy. The orientation for the batch 5 is already concluded but the first test is going to commence on coming Jan 27th. So those who wish to join in this batch click the link provided in the description. Now with this note let us get into the daily Hindu news analysis. Today I am going to cover 8 different news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 24th of January 2023 and displayed here are a list of news articles that we will be discussing today you can go through it and those who have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel please subscribe and do hit the bell icon button to get regular notifications regarding our content of his videos. Now let us get into first news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article, this news article talks about norovirus. It is in news because despite efforts taken to contain its spread, two school children in Ernakulam district of Kerala have been confirmed with norovirus infection. So in this background let us understand what is this norovirus infection. See norovirus is the term for a group of viruses that causes severe vomiting and diarrhea. It is very common and very easy to spread meaning it is highly contagious. It can spread through infected people, contaminated food or contaminated surfaces. While many people call norovirus as the stomach flu or the stomach bug, it has no relation to the flu that is influenza. Yes, flu is caused by influenza virus and it is different from the norovirus. Now talking about the transmission, people can become infected with norovirus in many ways. People with norovirus illness can shed billions of norovirus particles and only a few virus particles can make other people sick. That means you can get the virus through close contact with someone who is sick or by touching contaminated surfaces and then touching your mouth or by eating or drinking contaminated foods or water. This is about transmission. Now coming to the symptoms, norovirus can make you feel very sick. Symptoms usually appear 12 to 48 hours after your exposure to the virus and it lasts for 2 to 3 days. These symptoms can appear suddenly and include nausea, throwing up that is vomiting, then diarrhea, stomach cramps, headache, fever and body aches. This is all about symptoms. Now talking about treatment, there is no treatment to cure norovirus. But you can take steps to ease symptoms while the virus runs its course. These include drinking plenty of liquids because the norovirus infection causes heavy dehydration. In extreme cases, patients have to be administered rehydration fluids intravenously. Then other steps include getting lots of rest and eating bland foods. This is about treatment. Now talking about precaution, norovirus often spreads quickly in closed places where many people gather such as schools, cruise ships and nursing homes. Most cases happen during the winter and early spring months. Some everyday precautions you can take to reduce your risk of getting the virus include washing your hands often with soap and water, then washing fruits and vegetables completely and cooking seafood thoroughly. See these are all some of the precautions that helps to reduce the risk of getting norovirus infection. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this news article discussion we saw about norovirus infection, then we saw about how it is spreading, then we saw about the symptoms of the norovirus. And finally, we saw some points regarding treatment and precaution measures. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims exam because UPSC may put a question regarding the symptoms and precaution and all. So, make note of each and every point that we discussed. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article here. This news article is about one nation, one election. The government has been raising pitch for the idea of one nation, one election since a long time. And many parties are expressing opposition against this idea. And this news article is also about a similar opinion expressed by the Aam Admi party. So in this context, let us try to understand about this idea of one nation, one election. Then we will also see why there is a need for such a system. And finally, we will try to analyze the advantages and disadvantages associated with one nation, one election. Okay. Now before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is displayed here. You can go through it. Now first we will start by understanding the idea of one nation one election. We all know the last general election happened in 2019. The next election will be conducted in 2024. In between this time span many state assembly elections happened and in some states it is going to happen in coming days. 
this idea of one nation one election is about structuring the indian election cycle in a manner where elections to the lok sabha and the state legislative assemblies are synchronized together so that the elections to both lok sabha and the state legislative assemblies can be held within a given span of time okay so what is the need for synchronizing them see elections are an integral part of a democratic state but it comes with some costs and problems too if you see until 1967 the cycle of a state and central elections was synchronized but after that many assemblies were dissolved before the tenure so it disturbed this one nation one election pattern due to these problems there are elections happening every year and again the cost of these elections is also much higher this keeps on increasing year on year due to inflation for example in 1952 the election cost was around 10.45 crore but in 2014 it was 3870 crore can you notice this huge rise it is immense but this is only the cost of the election commission excluding transportation security management advertisement by parties and many more according to a survey in the last lok sabha election parties all over india spent approximately 7 billion us dollars so the government felt that it would be helpful if the elections are synchronized and the law commission has sought the views from various stakeholders on simultaneous elections although many parties have opposed the move there are mixed opinions so with reference to this we will understand what are the advantages and disadvantages associated with one nation one election now first let's see about advantages see firstly the government officials do not have to leave their duty very often as most of us are aware it is usually the government officials who are employed as election officers of course government officials are there to serve the people but pulling them off their service often for conducting elections would hinder the functioning of public offices so if we have simultaneous elections government officials do not have to spare their time for every election also it will reduce the burden on the administrative setup and security forces employed for the safe conduct of election this is about the first advantage then second advantage is that politicians do not have to focus on elections happening around the five years at different places rather they will be focused on development see elected representatives get involved in election campaigning every time election happens this keeps them away from doing their duty so if you have simultaneous elections the politicians will focus on other activities without caring so much about earning vote bank every now and then this is about second advantage then the third advantage is that financial crimes like extortion and corruption will reduce then the fourth advantage is that the political parties will enhance their work to influence the people as their next chance will be after a long wait only it will also provide more time to all the stakeholders that is political parties election commission of india paramilitary forces and civilians for the preparation of election once in 5 years then lastly much lesser costs will be incurred in managing elections together as i mentioned earlier this is about advantages associated with one nation one election now we will see what are the challenges associated with this process that is the disadvantages the first disadvantage is that regular elections around the tenure will force politicians to meet people often so a one time election will decrease their accountability to the people secondly there would arise confusion among the voters the election commission has to make voters aware of the new criteria but it is not easy to do that because people with low level of literacy will not be able to differentiate between the general election and assembly election this is the second disadvantage thirdly opportunity for regional parties would diminish as the national parties will dominate the election narrative apart from this security threats will be raised at that time this is because anti national elements can turn it into an opportunity of creating havoc by misleading or misguiding the people then the other disadvantage is that many opposition parties argue that this is against the federal structure opposition parties feel that viewing elections from the prism of expense and not celebrating the greatness of democracy itself is wrong this in turn would put additional burden on the election commission apart from this to sync the term of state legislative assemblies with that of lok sabha the term of the state legislative assemblies should be reduced and increased accordingly some governments may not be willing to give up their term so what can be done about this there are few opinions we will see what are they see in india fixing the dates is not feasible because of the parliamentary form of government so a radical solution is to switch to the presidential form of government or we can just choose to synchronize only the elections to the lok sabha and the rajya sabha that way we can save some expenditure before considering these options 
we must have a deep study and deliberation on the idea in order to prevent any impact on the model code of conduct then there needs to be a consensus whether the country needs one nation one poll or not all political parties should cooperate in debating this issue once the debate starts the public opinion can be taken into consideration see india being a mature democracy can then follow the outcome of the debate and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is one nation one election policy then we saw about the advantages and disadvantages associated with that and finally we saw some options available to us see this topic is very much important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this snippet article from the text and context page as we see itself in the title there has been a decline in investments made via p notes the article says that investment in the indian capital markets through p notes slightly dropped to rupees 96292 crore at the end of december 2022 from the preceding month this is about the article in our discussion today let us look at p notes in detail first of all let us understand about p notes see the p notes are financial instruments here p stands for participatory the participatory notes are issued by foreign institutional investors the p notes are issued to foreign investors and hedge funds from investors who wish to invest in the indian stock market without registering with sebi that is securities and exchange board of india foreign investors prefer investing via p notes because the p notes have less regulatory oversight this is because while the foreign institutional investors have to report all the investments made via p notes each quarter to sebi they need not disclose the identity of the actual investors so foreign investors invest via p notes now let me explain the working of p notes with an example let us assume that abc limited is a foreign institutional investors registered in sebi since the foreign institutional investor is registered with sebi it can invest in indian stock market let us say the abc limited buys stocks of companies x y and z this is the investment or financial portfolio of the abc limited here an investment portfolio is just a basket of financial assets now let's assume an imaginary foreign investor named jeffrey dahmer mr dahmer wants to invest in indian stock but he does not want to get registered with sebi and reveal his identity now what mr dahmer will do is he will contact abc limited and ask the firm to issue him an offshore derivative here derivative is basically a contract that derives its values from the performance of an underlying entity so in our example here the underlying entity is the investment portfolio of abc limited which is nothing but the stocks of companies x y and z so after mr dahmer's request the abc limited will issue the offshore derivative to him this offshore derivative is called participatory notes so finally as per mr dahmer's wish he is investing in the indian stock market without registering with the sebi and mr dahmer makes money when the price of underlying entity increase that is when the price of the shares of companies x y and z increases this is about the working of participatory notes also this is why the participatory notes are termed as offshore derivative instruments having understood the basics now let us see the advantages associated with participatory notes firstly investing through participatory notes is very simple due to this reason the p notes are very popular amongst foreign investors so india is receiving a lot of foreign investment via participatory notes then secondly investments made through p notes are beneficial to the indian economy as they can provide quicker means of raising funds for the benefit of the companies listed in the indian stock market this is all about the advantages now let us see the issues associated with participatory notes first is the issue of money laundering as we saw earlier people investing in p notes are not registered with the sebi so sebi has no jurisdiction over participatory note trading so the trade made via the participatory notes is not recorded due to this only the officials are worried that the p notes might be used for money laundering then the second issue is volatility since the trading of p notes is not regulated by sebi the trade is very volatile meaning the investor can pull out their investment any time due to this indian rupee also become very volatile then the third issue is the loss of tax revenue to india see if a foreign investor is investing in p notes the country in which the foreign investor resides will get tax amount that are derived from the capital gains and the dividends of p notes due to this india is losing tax revenue also some entities route their investments through participatory notes 
to take advantage of tax laws that are available in certain countries. For example, if country X has fewer capital gains tax than India, even an Indian investor will route his money via country X to save on taxes. All these results in less tax revenue to India. See, these are all some of the issues associated with participatory notes. Now finally, let us see a few reasons why investments made via P notes are currently on decline. The first reason is the US Federal Bank or the Fed's decision to increase interest rates. The Fed is increasing its policy rates to control inflation in the USA. Due to this, the foreign investors are looking to invest in safe assets in the US rather than riskier assets in India. This is the main reason behind the recent decline in investments via P nodes. Then the second reason is the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. The war in Ukraine is making the investment climate in the entire world volatile. This is also one of the reasons why investors are pulling out of P nodes. See, these are all some of the reasons why investments in P nodes is drying up. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about P nodes, then how it is working. Then we saw about the advantages and disadvantages associated with P nodes. And finally, we saw the reasons why investment in P nodes are declining. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article from the editorial page. It talks about a newly drafted Digital Personal Data Production Bill 2022. This editorial does not contain provisions about the bill. Instead, it highlights some of the issues associated with the bill. If you want to know about the important provisions of the bill, then watch our 20th November 2022 analysis. Now in this discussion, let us see the issues in the bill and we will also see some solutions to overcome the issues. But before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here. You can go through it. First of all, let us see in brief about what we are going to discuss. See, in this discussion, we are going to see the provision which makes mandatory parental consent for all data processing activities by the children. See, the draft Digital Personal Data Production Bill 2022 currently provides for mandatory parental consent for all data processing activities by the children. Here, children are defined as any person aged under 18 years. But this approach has some issues. And the author is talking about issues regarding this only. Firstly, she is saying that instead of asking the online platforms to build safer and better services for minors, the bill relies on parents. Know that parents only have to grant consent on behalf of the child in all the cases. The issue here is that India is a country with low digital literacy. So, as of now, parents are only relying on their children to help them with the internet. So, the provision which requires the consent of the parent is ineffective, right? We have seen this in our homes itself. Parents only will ask us to create an account in some app or in some cases, they don't even know how to operate smartphone. So, how will they be able to grant consent in this condition? This is what the issue according to the author. Secondly, the provision does not take into account the best interests of the child. The best interest of the child is a standard originated in the Convention on the Rights of Child 1989. Comment below in the comment section whether India is a signatory to this Convention on Rights of Child 1989 or not. The best interest of the child should be taken into account when statutes are formed. And know that India too had upheld the standard in laws such as the Commissions for Production of Children Rights Act 2005, then secondly, the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act 2009 and the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012. But now, according to author, the standard was not taken into account in the Data Production Bill. Why is she saying like this? Think about it now. Teenagers also comes under the category of child right. And for what they use the internet? They use internet platforms for self-expression and personal development right. Their usage ranges from taking music lessons to preparing for exams. They also use these platforms to form communities with people of similar worldviews. Some are using it to build a career. You have seen many teenagers doing vlog and posting it on YouTube and earning money right. See the provision of mandatory consent from the parents is misguided because Instagram is seen as a social media platform and chatting means by the parents. But it is regularly used as an educational and professional development tool by millions of artists around the world. So because of this, the author is saying that the bill did not take into account the standard of the best interest of the child. Thirdly, the another issue in the bill is that each platform will have to obtain verifiable parental consent in the case of minors. 
to implement this provision the internet service providers should confirm whether a user is minor or not for this they have to verify the age of the user for this verification of age the government will prescribe later some proofs that will be accepted for the verification of age this may include any id proof or facial recognition or reference based verification but think about it now if id proofs and facial recognition are used then it means the service providers have more personal data with them and without any proper data protection measures this will lead to harms such as data breaches identity thefts etc so the citizens will be at more risk because of this provision see these are the major issues pointed out by the author in the editorial so what can be done according to the author there is a need for shift in approach the author is saying that when it comes to laws with respect to children we should think differently that is what applies to other categories can be applied to child category or not if all are treated equally then it would be like treating unequals equally secondly we should move from the child side to the platform side sounds confusing right i will explain it we are using options for tracking and monitoring the children's usage of internet but instead we should adopt a risk based approach to platform obligations so the internet platforms should be mandated to undertake a risk assessment for minors they should be mandated to design services with default settings and features that protect child from harm this will bring in an element of co regulation it can be done by creating incentives for platforms to design better products for children the thirdly the author is saying that we need to relax the age of mandatory parental consent for all services to 13 years now what is the advantage of this if we relax the age for consent requirements then it will automatically minimize data collection what does this mean this means less personal data collection so there would be no worries about data theft fourthly the author is saying that the government should conduct large scale surveys of both children and parents this survey is to find out about the parents as well as children's online habits digital literacy preferences and attitudes this will help in drafting the bill which is more suitable for the indian scenario finally the author is saying that there should be a policy in india that balances the safety and the agency of children online parents alone should not near the burden of keeping the children safe instead it should be made a society wide obligation and this societal obligation should be included in the data protection framework This is because we need the young minds for our country to make India as a digital India. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the contended provision in the draft Digital Personal Data Protection Bill. Then we saw what are all the issues associated with that particular provision. And finally, we saw some solutions to address the issues in the provision. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this news article here. As 2024 marks the completion of 100 years of ICOM protest, two representatives of Tamil Nadu Chief Minister visited the Tandai Periyar Memorial at ICOM in Kottayam, Kerala. This article says that the visit is part of plans to celebrate the completion of 100 years of the ICOM protest. So, in this background, let us understand what is this ICOM Satyagraha or ICOM protest. Now, let's start with the background of the ICOM Satyagraha. According to the prevalent class structure low caste Hindus were not allowed to enter the temples in Kerala they were not allowed even to steer on the roads that led to the temples in 1923 at a congress party meeting in the kakinada report citing the discrimination faced by the repressed class in Kerala was presented by TK Madhavan it was after this session the movements against untouchability got promoted A committee was formed in Kerala comprising people of various castes to fight untouchability. Know that K K Lappan was chairman of the committee. The other members of the committee include T K Madhavan, Velayudha Menon, K Neelakanthan Nambudri and T R Krishna Swami Iyer. In February 1924 they decided to launch a Kerala Paradanam so as to urge temple entry and also the proper use of public roads for each Hindu regardless of caste or creed. So this is about the background of the Vaikom Satyagraha. Now we will learn about the course of the movement. The Vaikom movement was started on March 30th, 1924. The foremost objective of the movement was the opening up of four public highways leading to Mahadeva Temple at Vaikom, which were closed to marginalized castes. The Satyagrahis made the batches of three people together and entered the temple. They were arrested and arrested by the local police. 
then the movement gained prominence within the entire india and support came from far and wide gandhi shri narayana guru and chattampi swamigal supported the movement nakalis of punjab supported the movement by fixing kitchens to supply food to the satyagrahis even when muslim and christian leaders were in support of the movement gandhi was not entirely happy with this as he wanted the movement to be an intra hindu affair on gandhi's advice temporarily the movement was taken back in april 1924 after the failure of discussions among hindus the leaders again started the movement leaders like kp keshav menon and tk madhavan were arrested know that ev ramasamy naikar who is the father of modern tamil nadu traveled from tamil nadu to support the movement he was arrested too on 1st october 1924 a team of so called upper caste called savarnas moved forward during a procession and submitted a petition to the regent maharani setu lakshmi bai of travancore the petition had about 25000 signatures for allowing entry to the temple for everybody gandhi ji also met with the regent maharani remember the procession was led by mannat padmanaban from beginning with approximately 500 people at vaikom the amount increased to 5000 approximately when the procession reached tiruvananthapuram in the month of november 1924 on 23rd november 1925 except for the eastern gate all the gates of mahadeva temple were open to hindus in 1928 backward castes got the right to move on public roads in the vicinity of all temples in travancore so this became the primary time that an organized movement was being conducted on such a huge scale for the essential rights of the untouchables and the other backward castes in kerala as a result of the movement in november 1936 the maharaja of travancore issued a proclamation throwing open all government controlled temples to all hindus irrespective of caste that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about the background of the vaikum satyagraha then we saw about the course of vaikum satyagraha As I said earlier, 2024 marks the completion of 100 years of Vaikum protest. So we may expect a question in prelims or mains regarding Vaikum Satyagraha. So make note of each and every points that we discussed in this article. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this image here. It says that the armed forces participate in the largest biennial tri-services amphibious exercise named Ampex 2023. It is given that the exercise was conducted near Kakinada in Andhra Pradesh. This is about the information given in this image. So, using this as an opportunity, now we are going to see some facts about the Ampex 2023. As we already saw, this Ampex exercise is a biennial exercise. What does this mean? It means the exercise is happening once in every two years. The last time it was happened in the year 2021 and it was in Andaman and Nicobar. Now in 2023 it is happening in Andhra Pradesh. Remember these facts, okay? Now coming to the term Ampex is a tri services amphibious exercise. What does this mean? This means that Ampex involves all the three services namely the Indian Army, Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy. Now what is the purpose of this exercise? Ampex 2023 includes complex activities in all domains that is Navy, Army and Air Force. These complex activities will help in attaining a high level of preparedness and coordination among the three services. This preparedness and coordination is needed to undertake the full spectrum of amphibious operations. You all know what is the meaning of amphibious right? It involves operations both on land and in water that is none other than oceans. Now some of the operations include employment of amphibious assault ships, then surveillance platforms, then execution of maritime air strikes. then complex maneuvers at sea then airborne insertion of marine commanders of navy and special forces of the army the naval gunfire support and finally amphibious landing of forces and follow on operations this is about the operations now let us see the final part which is the significance of this ampex exercise firstly as we already saw it helps in preparing and coordinating all the services of our country in times of emergencies Secondly the exercise serves as a platform for testing the working of our defense equipments in all the three services. Thirdly such an exercise is very important to drive out military progress of China in the Indian Ocean. And that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about Ampex 2023 exercise then we saw about the purpose of this exercise and finally we saw some significance associated with such exercise. Now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion. 
see this article here yesterday our president draupadi murmu conferred the pradhan mantri rashtriya bal puraskar 2023 on 11 children these 11 children includes one child with a rare bone disorder who is now an accomplished singer and a youngster who jumped into a river to save the life of a woman so in this background let us understand few facts about the pradhan mantri rashtriya bal puraskar The Pradhan Mantri Rashtriya Bal Puraskar was formerly known as the National Child Award for Exceptional Achievement. It is a civil honor bestowed upon exceptional achievers. The award was instituted by the Ministry of Women and Child Development in 1996 to recognize child with exceptional abilities and outstanding status in various fields like academics, arts, culture, design, innovation, research, social service and sports. The award is conferred by the President of India in the week preceding the Republic Day where the nation's other prestigious civil honors like the Bharat Ratna, Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan and Padma Shri are also presented. The award is also participate in the Republic Day parade. Now who selects the name of the award is? See a national selection committee headed by Minister of Women and Child Development will finalize the name of award is for the Pradhan Mantri Rashtriya Bal Puraskar. Know that the awards are given under two categories, that is Bal Shakti Puraskar and Bal Kalyan Puraskar. Bal Shakti Puraskar is given by the government of India every year to recognize exceptional achievement of children in various fields, that is innovation, scholastic achievements, social service, arts and culture, sports and bravery. It was instituted in 1996 as the National Child Award for Exceptional Achievement, which got renamed from 2018 as. Bal Shakti Puraskar Now talking about the eligibility of this award a child who is Indian citizen and residing in India and he or she should be between 15 to 18 years of age Know that a medal and a cash prize of rupees 1 lakh will be awarded along with book vouchers worth rupees 10000 a certificate and a citation This is all about Bal Shakti Puraskar Now talking about Bal Kalyan Puraskar see it is given as recognition to individuals and institutions who have made an outstanding contribution towards service for children in the field of child development child protection and child welfare it was instituted in 1979 as the national child welfare awards which got renamed from 2018 as bal kalyan puraskar now talking about the eligibility an individual who is an indian citizen and residing in india and he or she should have attained the age of 18 years or above as on 31st august of respective year then he or she should have worked for the cause of children for not less than 7 years this is about the eligibility criteria to individual now talking about the eligibility criteria for institution the institution should not be entirely funded by the government and the institution should have been in the field of child welfare for 10 years and performing consistently in that field know that three awards are given in each of the two categories that is individual and institution categories along with cash prizes and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about pradhan mantri rashtriya bal puraskar awards then we saw about the two categories that is bal shakti puraskar and bal kalyan puraskar now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that yesterday the fifth scorpion class conventional submarine that is ins vagir was commissioned into the indian navy at the naval dockyard in mumbai now in this context let us learn about the scorpion class submarines to understand about the scorpion class submarines of india first we should know about project 75 see in the year 1999 the cabinet committee on security approved a 30 year plan to indigenously build and inject 24 submarines by 2030 so in the first phase two lines of production were to be established the first is project 75 and the second is project 75i so this line was to produce six submarines each Now project 75 includes the indigenous construction of six diesel electric attack submarines of Scorpion design. The submarines are being constructed at Masagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited in Mumbai. This is in collaboration with the Naval Group of France. This would provide a major boost to the indigenous design and construction capabilities of submarines in India. In addition to this, it will bring in the latest submarine design and technologies as part of the project. Now under project 75 INS Kalwari INS Kanderi INS Karnaj and INS Vela have been commissioned yesterday Vagir was also commissioned know that INS Bakshir is the sixth and it is yet to be commissioned 
and as i earlier told you these are of scorpion design now we will learn about this scorpion class submarines see the scorpion class submarines are one of the most advanced conventional submarines in the world it is capable of undertaking multifarious missions including anti surface ship warfare anti submarine warfare intelligence gathering mine laying and area surveillance this class of submarines have diesel electric transmission systems and these are primarily attack submarines or hunter killer types which means they are designed to target and sink adversary naval vessels also the submarines have superior stealth features here note that the submarines have an estimated endurance of approximately 50 days that is they can remain submerged under water for around 50 days without surfacing then their weapon systems are capable of firing torpedoes and anti ship missiles the first submarine of this class that is the INS Kalvari was commissioned in December 2017 that is why sometimes we call this as Kalvari class submarines so don't get confused now finally we will understand some important features of INS Vagir this submarine gets its name from the erstwhile Vagir which was a submarine that served in the navy between 1973 and 2001 where it undertook numerous operational missions Vagir will boost the indian navy's capability to further india's maritime interests and like most other scorpion class submarines INS Vagir is also capable of undertaking diverse missions including anti surface warfare anti submarine warfare intelligence gathering mine laying and surveillance missions INS Vagir would form a part of the western naval command it has advanced stealth features and long range guided torpedoes as well as anti ship missiles know that vagir has the distinction of having the lowest build time among all indigenously manufactured submarines till date that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about project 75 then we saw about scorpion class submarines and finally we saw some features of ins vagir now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at this first question this question is regarding norovirus two statements are given we have to find which of the given statements are incorrect look at this first statement a person can be infected with different varieties of norovirus several times in their lives but developing immunity to one type does not provide protection against other varieties yes this statement is correct the immunity developed because of one type does not provide protection against other varieties so statement one is correct coming to the second statement the virus can affect people across all age groups this statement is also correct remember norovirus can affect people across all age groups but is known to cause serious symptoms in children the elderly and people with comorbidities comorbidity means more than one disease or condition is present in a person at the same time see comorbidities are common among adults with arthritis so statement 2 is also correct now the question is asking for incorrect statement here both statements are correct so the correct answer for the question is option d neither one nor two moving on let's take up the second question this question is regarding ampex exercise four options are given we have to find which option is related to ampex exercise now look at this first option an annual exercise involving the special forces of india and america see this option is wrong because this option defines vajra prahar exercise see vajra prahar is a annual exercise which is hosted alternatively between special forces in india and the united states so option one is wrong now coming to the second option an exercise involving the air forces of india and russia see this option is also incorrect because this option defines exercise avia indra see avia indra is an air force level exercise between india and the russian federation so option b is also wrong now coming to the third option a biennial exercise involving the tri services of india see this option only is the correct answer as we saw in the discussion ampex exercise is a biennial exercise that is held once in 2 years and it involves the tri services of india so the correct answer for the question is option c moving on let's take up the third question this question is a previous year question which was asked in prelims 2021 this question is regarding bharat ratna and padma awards now look at this first statement bharat ratna and padma awards are titled under article 18 one of the constitution of india see this statement is incorrect because national awards such as bharat ratna padma vibhushan padma bhushan padma shri do not amount to titles within the meaning of article 18 one of the constitution and they are not to be used as prefixes or suffixes to the name of the recipient in any manner 
know that article 181 abolishes all titles it prohibits the state to confer titles on anybody whether a citizen or a non citizen note on point here military and academic distinctions are however exempted from the prohibition thus a university can give title or honor on a man of merit so statement 1 is incorrect because bharat ratna and padma awards do not amount to titles within the meaning of article 181 Now coming to the second statement Padma awards which were instituted in the year 1954 were suspended only once see this statement is also incorrect because Padma awards were instituted in 1954 to be awarded to citizens of India in recognition of their distinguished contribution in various spheres of activity the government suspended the practice of granting the Padma awards for 2 years in 1977 it was again suspended during mid 1992 when two PALs were filed in the high courts of India Now that Padma Awards are given in three categories, that is Padma Bhushan for exceptional and distinguished service, then Padma Bhushan for distinguished service of higher order, and finally Padma Shri, which is given for distinguished service. So statement two is incorrect because Padma Awards were suspended many times and not only once. Now coming to the third statement, the number of Bharat Ratna Awards is restricted to a maximum of five in a particular year. See this statement is also incorrect because A maximum of three people can be awarded the Bharat Ratna. The total number of Padma Awards to be conferred each year is limited to 120, but the count excludes posthumous awards and any non-resident Indian or overseas citizen of India or foreign-based winners. Remember this fact. So, statement three is incorrect because the number of Bharat Ratna Awards is restricted to three in a particular year. Now, the question is asking for incorrect statement. All the three statements are incorrect, so the correct answer for the question is option D, one, two, and three. Now coming to the final question. This question is regarding INS Vagir. Look at this first statement. INS Vagir is India's first indigenous nuclear-powered ballistic missile capable submarine. In the second statement, INS Vagir is named after an island fort built by Chhatrapati Shivaji. In the third statement, INS Vagir is the Indian Navy's largest aircraft carrier and warship. See if you see the statements one and three. they contradict each other one says it is a submarine and three says it is an aircraft carrier so one and three cannot come together therefore we eliminate option b if you know that ins arihant is india's first indigenous nuclear powered ballistic missile capable submarine then you can eliminate the options a b and c and arrive at the answer d so the correct answer for the question is option d none of the above and know that ins kanderi has been named after Island fort built by Chhatrapati Shivaji, which played a key role in his navy, and it is not INS Vagir. So that's why the statement two is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, INS Vikramaditya is the Indian Navy's largest aircraft carrier and warship converted from the Russian Navy's decommissioned Admiral Gorshov or Baku, and it is not INS Vagir. So statement three is also incorrect. Therefore, once again, the answer for the question is option D, none of the above. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. And don't worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify it. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers, and post it in the comment section. With this, we came to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment, and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar Ayer Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.